1953, Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzin Norgay were the first men to reach the top of Everest. This is the untold story of the man who got Hillary to Everest, my father, Earl Rudiford. We were coming to the Himalayas in search of my father. In 1951, he had organised the first New Zealand expedition to the Himalayas, which Sir Edmund Hillary had joined as a late ringer. And that had led to Hillary's climbing of Everest in 1953. And the rest, as they say, is history. My father had died in 1989, and his story in getting Hillary to Everest had largely been forgotten, a small footnote to that extraordinary achievement. And then in his final autobiography, Hillary wrote some fairly damning remarks about my father, which upset my family and made us question what little we knew. Why had Hillary been so ungracious? Hillary was now New Zealand's most admired hero. He even outshone our great rugby legends. He was as close to a god as a mortal could be in our country, yet it had been my father that helped to get him there. What should you do when the man on the $5 note disparages your father? Should you question New Zealand's most beloved hero? Can any good come from that? History doesn't smile on the Osirans who should know their place and keep a dignified silence. The whole thing was unsettling and confusing. In the case of where you sit with, with that and, and what Ed Hillary had said about Earl Rutherford in, in, in his book, um, I agree. I don't know if there's a lot to be gained from trying to refute it or to even confront it. Yeah. But, yeah, I, I, I really don't, don't know. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm, it's, it's a hard thing for probably everybody still involved. <laughs> Actually, the 10th anniversary of Earl's death. Oh. I was in the bookshop in Nelson, and yeah. I was, you know, buying something else, waiting at the counter to be served. And I know the woman Susie Blackmore who works there, right. so I let her serve somebody else so I could have a chat with her. And I started leaving, and it sort of fell open on this page. Mm. And I, honestly, I felt like tap tap on the shoulder. Have you seen this, daughter? Mm. Um, um, I never liked Earl Rutherford, none of us did. I wouldn't, you know, I'd never shared a rope mm. with him, mm. which it seemed to me the biggest insult you could. Mm. Why did he do that? Yeah. To say or imply about another climber that you would never share a rope with them is an extremely damning remark. It was the ultimate slur from New Zealand's most revered hero. What had my father done to have earned this? You don't want to be coming across as sour grapes. You, you should one even should one leave well alone these things, or should, what should one do? I well, the rest of the world isn't going to pay that much attention, but history might. Um, some PhD student a hundred years from now will, 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 will could be sifting through this and go, oh wait a minute, there's an alternative point of view here.
no one's listening, but even so. <laughs> Well, someone will. Someone will listen. Yeah. But for your own, your own life, you do. Did you did, did you discuss this with your mum? Did your mum ever talk about your dad's standing and, and his contribution? Or yeah, I mean, she was. I think she was very put out by that remark because mm. they'd actually um, she'd met Hillary quite a few times and they had come to lunch and you know Ed's exactly dad, they'd been quite they'd been a sort of they weren't close friends but they'd certainly kept yeah and, and you, they were climbing over the hills and things like together yeah. yeah so she was slightly shocked at that mm. last remark because it did, it came out of a very different place than the Hillary that she'd known. in all of this. She was very, very sad with the way Earl's reputation and, and, his, and his legacy was being belittled and made less of year by year by things like Ed's autobiography and Tom Scott's documentary series and I don't know, one thing after another, Earl was getting written out of history except for the part where he was this kind of bogeyman. So she was very concerned that that was very unfair to him, and as his, as her daughter, I, I felt like I'd like to do something, to, anything I could to address that, um, even if it meant finding out the truth. And that all happened in the early 2000s, just after Hillary's book came out, which started us on a journey that was to take nearly 20 years to unravel. Oh, dear. That's marvellous. Let's just, I think that that was bound to happen at this point. Let's have a bit of a restack. My mother Rose had been very upset by Hillary's remarks. They didn't square with Ed Hillary Jr. And in that period, you saw quite a bit of the Hillary's from time to time, didn't you? Yes, we did, on good terms. Why did Except you... Except Ed was hard to feed. That was awkward. Um, I think they made that dirt. Did they? Yeah, they made that dish that was very popular at the time with ham and egg and asparagus mm. and he didn't really care for that. I ended up by saying to him, well I've seen a photograph of you Ed sitting on a rock eating sardines. So I got it him and you have those. We knew this was code for our mother's displeasure with Hillary's comments. She spoke in riddles and never really said what she was thinking. Scene of George Lowe and Ed Hillary and Whether Hillary's tin of sardines had caused him any pause was hard to know, but she had made her point. Back then, we didn't know what approach we should take. My own relationship with my father had been fractious, and I was in no hurry to tell his story. I wasn't a climber and had had little to do with that side of my father's life. It was my sister who was driving this. Well, we haven't quite got an angle on that. Have That's what we? I mean. What is the angle? Why should well, that, want that's to... my sort of angle is, is that um, what so, created Ed Hillary, really? What created New Zealand climbers being the best in the world? That's my father peering over my sister's shoulder, by the way. Curious to see what we were going to do. He had died 12 years previous, and what we could find of his story lay among some dusty old photographs, letters to his mother, and some voice recordings of public talks he had given. In truth, I had never been a fan of my father and was not wanting to glorify him. But my sister Anna was determined that we should not let Hillary's remarks go unchallenged. We had opposing views about my father's legacy. But when she rang to tell me that a meeting had been organised with a mountaineering historian, I found myself on an aeroplane with my camera. I mean, the problem is we've got this sort of version of history, the Ed Hillary version of history, which is the dominant version. It's like when Muldoon... And it's also evolved to quite a well, bit, Well, of course it? it has evolved quite a bit, and that's the problem. That's, that's why if I'm doing anything on Ed Hillary, I go back to the Alpine yeah. Journal and his book High Adventure of that time, you see, yeah. and you get that's the earliest record. Yeah. And uh, it's probably the most trusting, trustworthy. Yeah. Oh, look at the Alpine Journal. It turned from a tiny, skinny little volume when I was putting them together last night in order, in the 30s, it was locked, and then suddenly turned into a monster volume. Oh, it's got a complete set. 
of the world. He's got the very first edition, you know. The, the Alpine journals were still displayed in my mother's room like a sacred text. An Alpine journal, volume one, number one, March 1892. Waiting for this moment, perhaps for a truth to be revealed. That's June 1934. So something. <laughs> something changed. Most people know the story of the climbing of Everest, but there was also a story that few people had heard. The group of mountaineers my father had been among that had paved the way for the climbing of Everest in 1953. They'd been part of a remarkable group of climbers that explored the Southern Alps in their weekends and holidays and the years following the Second World War, pioneering many routes and first ascents. It had been the golden years of New Zealand alpine adventure. There was a growing confidence among the Kiwi mountaineers that led in 1951 to my father's plan to organise the first New Zealand expedition to the Himalayas. It seems like an extraordinary audacious plan for a bunch of poor university students living in the South Island of New Zealand trying to kickstart their lives after the Second World War. Who was this person, I wondered? I knew he loved the mountains. He'd even dropped out of law school for a while to go and work as a farmhand on the west coast so he could be closer to the Southern Alps. We'd been exploring and climbing and we, de well, we didn't know whether we would be up to the demands, whether we were technically proficient enough for the Himalayas. Um, which is funny because when you got over to Britain and got into the European Alps you realise that you had as good snow and ice skills as certainly probably better ones than many of the British people um, but uh, New Zealand had always like Australia kowtowed to uh, uh, the home country um, but we, we were getting, wanting to get across and get more exploratory, get into this country. Um, and when it became open again after the war, uh, then uh, people could see the possibilities. Bill Packard had been the second only New Zealander to go on a British expedition to the Himalayas when in 1950 he'd been invited by legendary British explorer Tillman. My father had been inspired by Tillman's accounts of his Himalayan adventures which had led him to thinking that maybe it was time for New Zealanders to have a go. His initial plan was to try to get permission for Everest, but after many months of correspondence, it became clear that New Zealand was well down the list in getting a permit to climb Everest from the Nepalese side. The whole region was in turmoil. China had just invaded Tibet and was on the brink of war with India, so there was no climbing Everest from the traditional northern side. Tibet and Nepal off-limits, 
My father set his sights on an unclimbed peak in the Indian Gawal Himalayas, Mukhapabat, which was right on the Indian border with Tibet above Badranath. Well, the Gawal is a part of the Indian High Himalayas, part of the Himalayan chain, uh, which is out to the west of Nepal. And it's an area which has some quite high peaks, uh, Kamut being one of the highest ones. And the Garwal was an area that was relatively undiscovered and took uh, quite a lot of negotiation to get into it. Nearly everybody, in, including Earl's closest climbing friends, were highly sceptical that you could do this. Then there was the fact about, you know, the money, they're not, they're nobody, none of them had any experience of the Himalayas. I mean, that was the extraordinary thing. We drove from my sister's home in Nelson to Christchurch to find out what my father's climbing buddies could tell us. We argued the toss as to where the story was leading and what the boundaries were. I wanted to find out what light they could shine on Hillary's remarks about my father, but Anna was more interested in hearing about their stories. When I was still a student, I was just so much in debt. And actually it took, it took three years before I got out of debt that uh, I didn't have any, any ambitions while I was still a student to, for overseas climbing. And uh, uh, Earl was the first person I talked about who seemed to uh, be at all likely to ever make it, but it seemed so distant. Earl had to find people who could go. I mean, he'd been around the traps and there wasn't anybody who had the time. I mean, that was three to four months off out of a, a busy career in your life and put up that sort of money. And those sort of people are few and far between. You have to be pretty keen on the mountains. And Ed Hillary was single. You had to have single people. And some people were married and completely ruled it out. Everybody says that Bill Bevan knows the most about the organising of the Kiwi expedition. And he was a good friend of Earl's and he knows the most about Earl and how, um, Earl's sort of career on the mountains evolved, but he is also the most reluctant to talk to us because I think he's the most committed towards maintaining a unified front of private um, disappointment in the way events have been described, but public silence. And um, he sees there is little to be gained in rehashing this, and a, particularly from a pair like us who don't know the mountains, we're not climbers, and we appear to have not adequately researched all of this to even understand what they're talking about. And also, uh, Ed Hillary and George Slater had expressed an interest, but there's one thing about saying I want to go to the Himalayas, but it's a very different thing doing all the work to get there. And, and they did have it made. I mean, Earl did all that and got them there. So it was easier to go when you've been when it was the work was done rather than saying, well, you organise a trip to the Himalayas and you do all the work, especially in those days. I gave this lecture and I sat down next to Earl and he said to me, how would you like to come to the, to the Himalayas? And I said, that would be absolutely great. I couldn't believe it. I presumed it was just a dream he had. Originally the party was to be Norman Hardy and Jim McFarlane and Bill Bevan uh, and Ed Cotter from Christchurch and none of those first three were able to go. I got in touch with Ed Hillary who I had just met him but he and George Lowe were both very prominent climbers at that time we heard that they were thinking of going to the Himalayas themselves so I wrote to him and asked him if he would uh, like to join them, which he did. So in the end, my father teamed up with three people he didn't really know, Ed Cotter, George Lowe and Ed Hillary, on an expedition that would dramatically change all of their lives. My father was a lawyer, Ed Hillary a beekeeper, George Lowe a school teacher and Ed Cotter a photographer, but they all shared an extraordinary passion for the mountains. My father's old photographs were a kind of map for us. Large prints that he had used for his mountaineering talks had been stored in cupboards, gathering dust ever since. I had never been particularly interested in them. 
Tellingly, it was the camera that he had taken to the Himalayas that caught my eye. Now I began to look at them more closely. They were old and deteriorating, but I quite liked the decrepit look of them. Our father had never lost his love for the mountains. They were a kind of Shangri-La to him, a better place where real adventure could be had and maybe a more worthwhile life lived. We weren't a religious family, but if God was anywhere, he was staring at us from the top of a mountain. And this is the music God would have listened to as he was flying over the mountains. My father was mad about the Mozart opera Il Seraglio. George had been a student guide at Mount yeah. Cook for several years. Ed learned his mountaineering from, basically mm. from guides. Mm. Because Earl was the leader of the team, and although the others didn't want to call him the leader once we were <laughs> over there, there was quite a lot of confusion there. No, I mean, there was a photo of four of us sitting outside the dark bung bungalow, and they had, there was one chair like this. Yeah, they put you on the chair. No, they were all arguing as to who should sit there, so I just went and sat down. Yes, you see, Rose is, Rose is looking at, through these photos with oh. me. She goes, why is Ed sitting in that chair? That is very odd. Why does he have to sit there? Because they were all arguing about who should have the right <laughs> to sit there. So, so I just sat there. Ed Cotter took us to see George Lowe, Hillary's good friend and climbing companion, whose acquaintance with Ed Cotter had led to he and Ed Hillary being invited on the 1951 expedition. He was not a popular person in our household because of his account of that trip, but we needed to hear what he had to say. There was a, a story, and, you, and you're all here, and the, it's a wonderful alive. thing, yeah, <laughs> to be able to get your first-hand accounts of what happened. Yes. Well, it was because uh, Rosemary was upset about and you yeah. about what written the book that I, 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 I that I approached Ed at Mount Cook that they when he unveiled his statue. You read that in the shop, didn't you? Yeah, I was I was I was just oh, yeah. casually in the shop, George. Um, I'll get yeah. um, what was I doing? Sh buying something else, and I picked up this book and opened it. And, yeah, yes. and it, by coincidence, it turned out I didn't know this, but my mother told me it was the the ten year anniversary of Earl's death that I did this. I picked no, up this book. Oh, yes. I, was, I, I may have looked up Earl in the index. I don't know, but mm. I opened it up and oh, yes. right here, and it said, "I respected Earl's dogged determination, but I can't say that I actually liked him. None of us did." And I'm, like, oh. <laughs> I'm sitting on my seat at the bookshop, and then he fell off it. Yeah. On no occasion did I share a climbing route with Earl, and I had no wish to do so. Okay. Um, but then when it came to organising things, we got on reasonably well together. He had his particular cell skills, and, and I had mine. And he's made, there's quite a few comments like that, oh. as a matter of fact. Yes, I haven't read that book. Um, <laughs> and, and it sort of got me going, I thought, yes. well, after a couple of years, and when Graham Langton talked to us, I thought, well, maybe we'll go and... I'll go and talk ask, to these people and these, ask them. Is, is ask these ones that are still alive. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, when I got brave enough, I thought, well, yeah. first of all, I thought, oh my goodness, he was that awful. Mm. Nobody liked him. Yeah. <laughs> so we've asked Norman and Bill, and they seem to like him. But mm -hmm. I, under, I, I know it's a hard thing to come and. Yeah. You know, so it was this, is this what triggered you to come? Well, not come emotionally, I think that's, that's what got me started. Yeah. What was Earl like as a climber? He's a very good climber, but he was interesting that he was nearly always um, slow to get going. Mm. And, uh, you know, no, he was a good climber. He meant after he started or getting ready? <laughs> Brushing his hair. Yes. Right. No, it, he was, well, he was not uh, um, physically strong, was he? What do we say um, there? You know, he had great strength of, of mind and strength, strength of the determination. But he was, uh, in, in physically, physics, 
um, and from the jobs that he had, he would certainly very often arrived on these expeditions not as comparatively unfit. Mm. Yeah. But uh, it, on on planning, reading up, and you know, getting it all sorted mm. out, um, he was remarkable. This photograph really says it all. My father, weedy, gaunt, and an unpromising physical specimen, and Hillary, fit, athletic, and upstanding. Which one would you pick to climb Mount Everest? But my father was a very determined man. Your dad was a, a private schoolboy, uh, through and through, um, a, um, a thoroughly civilised, um, uh, almost Britishized person. He fitted in perfectly in Britain. The irony was that although my father had been born into a wealthy New Zealand farming dynasty, his personal circumstances had been very different. His father had died before he was born, plunging their family into penury, with occasional support from his wealthy relatives who paid for him to go to boarding school. His difficult childhood, cap in hand to his affluent cousins, I think, made him a very ambitious and driven adult, determined to succeed. Ed was a rough diamond. Uh, not a totally rough diamond, as you see, he's become as polished and brilliant as anything. But he was, he was a, a not a particularly macho New Zealander, but he ended up being something like a macho New Zealander. How to deal with Hillary's comments about my father continued to be an issue between my sister and I, and a source of friction and frustration. Uh, Sir Edmund Hillary is really important to New Zealand because without him we'd be incredibly dull. When I grew up in the 1950s, a, a British magazine called School Friend used to do potted biographies of every issue had a potted biography of a country. It said of New Zealand, it only lasted about, it might have been one or two more. New Zealand is a mountainous country with fast flowing rivers. The boys play rugby and the girls join marching teams. And I was about eight or nine when I read that and I thought, oh, good God, is that all we are? Is that all there is? Then Peter Snell came along. Then I discovered Ed Hillary and I realised, no, we did have a couple of heroes that were global. And actually, Ed Hillary is probably going to be an encyclopedia. As long as there are encyclopedias, encyclopedias, digital or otherwise, Ed Hillary will always be famous. And I got enormous pride and satisfaction out of his achievements. Pathetically, secondhand excitement. Money. How would you Back then, we seemed to be constantly driving between my sister's house in Nelson and Christchurch to find out what we could from my father's old mountaineering buddies. We listened to a tape that had been made of my father talking about his early mountaineering experiences in the Himalayas. I wasn't really focusing on what my father was saying, but thinking about how my sister and I had started on this journey, which wasn't something I imagined I would ever do. Did I really want to revive him or leave things as they stood? Anna was determined to press on. There was no denying my father's achievement in just getting the expedition away. As they were preparing to leave New Zealand, the country was gripped by New Zealand's largest ever water siders dispute, the 1951 waterfront strike. The ports were in lockdown and it seemed like the expedition was over before it had even begun. Hillary suggested they postpone, but my father was not about to give up. With some deft manoeuvring, he managed to get their gear on the last boat able to leave the port. Tremendous troubles. Um with the shipping strike, remember there was a great shipping strike in 1951, there was no freight at all for some considerable time. So I, I got hold of a friend who was travelling over, he took it as, or most of our gear as passengers' baggage. And we flew across uh, the four of us, that was uh, Ed Hillary, George Lowe, Ed Cotter and myself, there were two Eds, which was confusing. 
It was a curious thing to me that in most of the photographs, my father was often looking away from the camera as if preoccupied by something else. Almost like he didn't belong in the picture. One of the bigger challenges we're taking on something like a project of that nature is, is just, it's, it's not knowing what you don't know. And it's all about the logistics. Uh, and that's something that Earl was very good at, was getting the logistics sorted and putting the expedition together. And that was what makes an expedition work, even by today's standards. It's not so much just about the gear you've got and the quality of the climber, it's actually the strategy you put into place and uh, how you deal with the logistics. My sister and my own resolve was wavering badly about what to do next. Those among my father's mountaineering group that were still alive were all well into the 80s and it seemed like a good idea to record their stories while we still could. None of them were keen to be on camera and to be seen to be complaining about Hillary and were suspicious of our motives and that we would sensationalise the story. We decided the best thing to do was to invite them all to lunch, which might encourage them to talk and share their stories. We organised the occasion in Arthur's Pass, an alpine village where most of them had begun their mountaineering adventures just after the Second World War. We hoped the location and the occasion might encourage them to open up about what they really thought. It probably wrote a bit incautiously um, I think he just wants to You're far too generous to him. No, no, no. I think he, he uh, Ed wrote um, probably what he was uh, underneath feeling, um, but there are some things that, uh, particularly as time goes on, it's, it's better not to say. Uh, better not uh, say it? What exactly did he mean, and did we really want to know? As a documentary maker, I really did. I came away from the lunch thinking we weren't any closer to the story. I don't think it would have made a lot of difference. I did try with no. We debated it backward and forward. We had certainly got some good mountaineering stories, and the lunch had been unquestionably worthwhile in recording their accounts. They were all remarkable climbers, and their achievements had paved the way for Hillary's ascent of Everest. Yeah. Well, I just, I don't think that will do it. My sister and I were divided over what to do. The lunch seemed to pose more questions than it answered. It didn't seem like we were any closer to understanding why Hillary had said those things, nor did it feel like it answered any questions about my father or resolve anything for me. In the end, we decided to leave the Hillary question well alone. And that's where we left it, not really having settled for ourselves Hillary's remarks, but choosing not to take the thing any further. But something had shifted for me. I hung the photograph of the moment Hillary and Lowe turned back on the mountain. They had gone all that way to climb the Himalayas and my father and Ed Cotter continued on to the top. It made an interesting talking point and was the first time I had hung any of my father's mountaineering photos on my wall. His photos had always hung in my sister's houses, but only now did I start really noticing them. He'd even made a number of the photos into table mats, and we had dined on them as children with no further thought. They were part of the landscape of our family, but now they seem to be reproving me. And so a decade passed. My mother died and the family all came together for her funeral. Both our parents were now dead. Maybe that was truly the end of this chapter of our lives. My father had been problematic and it had not been an easy marriage but she had always championed his achievements as a climber, and she had started us on this journey. My three sisters, Sarah, Anna and Belinda, did battle over my mother's knickknacks while I opted out by filming the proceedings. Clearly, I hadn't completely given up on the documentary. I have to take my water bottle from the fridge, please. Lord, you're so exhausted.
How would you feel if I had the box plant and the f little thingy? Certainly, I didn't feel like I had done justice to the story, and there was a sense of unfinished business. The death of our mother made us think about it again. And then one day, my sister Anna had a ring from a writer, Lynn McKinnon. She had started writing a book about Ed Cotter, which had led her to the first New Zealand expedition to the Himalayas, and now she wanted to include my father. She arranged to meet my sister Anna at her house in Nelson. I thought I ought to be there. I think we all understand that we're going to balance the story without any obvious vitriol. Well, I think that the story of Ed Cotter without rancor just tries yes. to Yes. Lynn bought Ed Cotter about whom she had started writing the book. Ten years had passed and Ed Cotter was nearing his 90s and we were still making the documentary. No openness, I guess. To Grind, but this is redressing an injustice. Well, the vast majority of New Zealanders will, will be adherents of the Hillary faith and they don't... And they, they won't want to see their confidence and their hero shaken. The intention is nothing to do with that. That's why I, 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 I think that we restrict ourselves completely to the facts of the Himalayan expedition and to some commentary by authorities who have told, in their own words, their dismay to some extent um, of how Rutherford was portrayed. We attempted to explain to Lynn why we had come unstuck with the documentary and the difficulty we had in getting my father's climbing buddies to talk about what Hillary had said. Why Ed had written those, Ed Hillary had written those very um, provocatively mm. unpleasant things about Earl on his book. And um, you know, we started off at my mother's place with Graham Langton, and he really encouraged us to make it and people to talk to. But what happened? Why was I? But what happened was that both Bill Bevan, but particularly Norman, d really didn't want to sound like sour grapes. They thought that you might tell a sort of sensationalist, yeah, exploitive yeah, documentary, yeah. and so that made them very reticent and hard to hmm. draw in. And we, as we drove away, from the lunch, Richard said, well, that was a waste of time. We might as well throw it in the bin. And from then on, it was a real tussle. I think it's an inherently interesting story, but it is. It would be so much better if we had, maybe if we'd had a bit more self-belief. How, how did your mother? Yeah, but she must have. She just was so upset. And she yeah. and a bit, it, she went to a book signing of Ed Hillary's and slipped a note in his pocket. Oh. Yeah, she? yeah, because she couldn't. Nobody could talk to Ed anymore. You know, no. became kind of minded, and so she slipped this, you know, a two brute note sort of thing in his pocket. What did it say? I thought, you know, I thought we were friends. Or uh, ah. she was plotting something, but I think Bill was going to write a letter. And Bill, well, Bill and Norman did, and uh, and and Liz yeah. already found mention of that. How Norman said yes. that, that Hillary would never talk to him again. But never mind. They yeah. did write to him. I think quite clear that for Ed H Hillary to have taken that approach. Um, he, he, must have, he must have had, he must have been harbouring something which is intangible at this stage. And I think that it's very difficult to, to understand how he could do that when he owed so much to Earl Rutherford, that everything. Now, the, the, there are plenty of people who will say that that without Earl Rutherford, Hillary would never have made it to Everest. So, to be so ungracious in retrospect, when he was apparently friendly superficially. Uh, I don't think it's an admirable trait. After all, we are talking about the first New Zealand Himalayan expedition. We're not talking about a British expedition. And I, I do feel strongly knowing yeah. my father. He really was a person who was capable of that kind of vision. Yes. That was a lifelong characteristic yes. of his oh, yes. to be 
you know, that yes. positive, that optimistic, that enthusiastic to really go big. Like, That's what Ed keeps yeah, saying. Yeah, that was his it. extraordinary mm. quality and what he really, mm. besides that determination. Quite a huge determination. Yeah, organisation. Yes. It was really, he was a very, yes. very good organiser. Yeah. Uh, but also he had this incredible... A resolve. We did not grow up with a tall poppy syndrome in our house. No. No. We mm -hmm. had, if you can do it, you know, yes. You can do whatever you want. You yes. To, mm -hmm. Yeah, we had yes. the opposite of, you know, yeah. you're not good enough. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. You just need to treat your eyes as, you know, mm -hmm. think, think bigger. Certainly, that might be why my sister and I felt emboldened or foolhardy enough to embark on this documentary calling into question New Zealand's most treasured hero and father of the nation. History is written and how events are shaped by their biographers in the end determines how we remember them. Tom Scott had made several television series about Ed Hillary as well as writing a film script about him. Hillary's story was now being carefully shaped in his able hands and so to a certain extent was my father's. You wrote Hillary's last biography, did you? Well, here's a, here's a story about his ambition, which I wasn't going to tell you, but I will tell you. Um, he said to me, Tom, will you co-write it with me? Oh, are you sure, Ed? Yes, yes, you co-write it. Then he rang me up and said, look, the, the publisher, I spoke to the publisher, and they said, no one's ever heard of Tom Scott. It can't be co-written with Tom Scott because no one's ever heard of you, Tom. Sorry, but it can't be co-written with you. You can't get your name on the cover. I said, that's all right. If you mention me inside, we are written with Tom Scott. And he said, oh, well, we'll see what I can do. And then he sent me his chapters. And I got the first seven chapters and I read them. And I said, Ed, you've forgotten. He's an old man by then. I said, you've forgotten huge numbers of stuff. Plus, in National Geographic and Look and in Life and in interviews with me, there were all the stuff that, that, that hadn't appeared in any of his other biographies and all these new recent books. And suddenly there was all this, all this side lighting coming in, stories and facts from other people. And I said, Ed, there's tons of stuff that you haven't included. Would you like me to include that? And, and he said, OK. So I wrote, rewrote the first seven chapters in, as if it was Ed, but I wrote them. And then we went on Kim Hill and uh, discussing my Hillary biography for TVNZ. And they said, oh, Tom, would you stay behind? Ed wants to have a word. So I said, oh, OK, sure. So I came behind, stayed behind, and the phone went on. There was Ed in Auckland. Oh, Tom, Ed here. And I said, "Hey, Ed, how's it going? Oh, not too bad. He said, oh, those first seven chapters. And I said, yes, yes. Oh, I was like a puppy waiting to be patted. Yes, Ed, yes, Ed. He said, oh, they're too good. And I said, what? And he said, they're too good. And I wasn't quite sure what he was saying. And I said, I'm sorry. He said, they're too good. I wouldn't write that well. Don't rewrite them like that. And I just provide, he wanted me to provide it with information which he would choose to use or not use. But those first seven chapters which don't include the remark about your father, by the way. Those seven, he didn't change them, I'll go back to his original version, he kept them, and that was material I was going to put in my own book. My own book on Ed was completely made redundant by the fact I gave all the obscure, obtuse stuff, I pumped into his book, he, the first seven chapters, which were too good, he didn't change a word of. All the other stuff I provided, he kept, again, 
and I get, I get thanked in acknowledgement as, or I'd like to thank Tom Scott has been a great help. He didn't say Tom Scott who wrote the first seven chapters or, and lots of other stuff. And I, I, and I got paid and I got acknowledged and I got a nice little hand script. But I thought, oh, this is probably how some of the other climbers felt. Ed was not an obviously fulsome, generous man when it came to acknowledging other people's contributions. So the book I was going to write could never happen. <laughs> Since I read the book in 1996, I think my feelings have changed. I would say they've matured. I don't feel um, there was any basis to what Ed Hillary said. Um, I never liked Earl Ridderford. None of us did. I feel quite confident and happy that Earl had many friends and um, was well-liked in the mountains. That was a weird statement. Um, of Ed's and, and very interesting for us to pursue because it tells you a lot more in fact about Ed Hillary than it did about Earl and that's how my feelings have changed. I used to think that comment was a reflection on Earl and now I realise it's a reflection on Ed. I had a sneaking suspicion that maybe Tom Scott had written the lines that offended my family so much. It appealed to my sense of irony that it might not actually have been Hillary that wrote it, but his biographers who were in the business of redrafting history. What galvanised my sister and the family was that, you know, I mean, I should say that I didn't like my father a lot when he was alive either, so mm. it wasn't a shock to read that, but it was upset my family and it was an interesting point to start a documentary. With. And what's your thought about that? I mean, I thought when I... I thought maybe when I heard you ghost wrote it that you might have inadvertently wrote that. No, I never wrote that line. Well, I, I had no basis to say that. I never met your dad, so I would never say that. If, if, if I wrote it somewhere, it would, I would, it would have to be a quote from someone. Um, and I know, but I, I didn't write that line. I, no, no reason for it. I guess we were, I was worried about that comment because at that time, you know, I was not that far out of still not liking my father very much myself. And there were lots of things about him that were quite troubling. And so I was like, ooh, you know, maybe he was a horrible person um, and a much more horrible person than I realised. So, but as time has gone by, my own feelings of love for my father has become much more dominant than those feelings of not liking him. And um, so I'm able to stand back from my own defensive position and see that it was about Ed. So Lynn coming into it and really finding exactly the same thing as we did is, is very rewarding and feels um, like something's been laid to rest, really. When we met with Lynn, I think really, the, for the first time was this time last year, but then in June, as I've, I've been freed to realise that in fact Earl has left us a great legacy himself in the mountains and exploring his achievements and before I was frightened by it because I thought you know he was this dubious figure in the climbing world but now I realize that's not true and he has left a great legacy and we're as his children are able to explore that and, and um, make the most of it. As part of her research Lynn McKinnon wanted to see the extraordinary trip the four did in preparation for the expedition to the Himalayas. It was a very difficult route along the knife edge Maximilian Ridge to the summit of Elie de Beaumont in the Southern Alps. No one had attempted this climb before, and it was to be many years before anyone repeated it. Ed, Hillary and George Lowe teamed up on one rope, and my father and Ed Cotter on the other, both teams jostling for who would lead, a tension that would play out right through their expedition to the Himalayas. 
As a kind of celebration of their climb, we chartered a helicopter and my three sisters and I, along with Lynn McKinnon and my father's old climbing buddies, flew over the route. It was an exhilarating moment, and it felt like years of doubt and negativity I had had about my father were beginning to fall away. And then somehow it seemed clear what we needed to do next. Go to the Himalayas and see for ourselves the mountain that my father and Ed Cotter had climbed and take our children with us. We're about eight, eight kilometers from the border with China. And, um, finding our camp spot for the night. This is the way into Mahabit, up the Chamara Glacier. And just looking at that, that looks like there could be a track. At least we're not going to have to find our way entirely over the, the moraine end tomorrow. So, that's cool. Just come along a bit and we'll just see if there's some more place in there where it starts. Okay, walk. Finally, we were there, far up an icy valley on the border with Tibet, about to set off for the camp where they had climbed Mokopabat. It was extremely cold and hard to breathe, but we were there where our father had begun his great adventure and changed the course of New Zealand climbing history. That's my father, before he lost most of his body weight from dysentery, attempting to wrangle the porters. They had very little money, and the porters were always on the point of desertion, but they were very fortunate in finding some very able Sherpas. My father, who'd been extremely sick, struggled to regain his health. After all those long months of planning and effort, it was touch and go whether his body would be up to the high altitude ascent of Mukapabat. camped off the side of the road north of Gastoli, very close, just a few kilometres away from the border with Tibet or China. Um, in fact, we camped beside a little military outpost and we're at the, I guess, the moraine end of the Chamaras Glacier and we're going to walk in today with 21 porters. Well, I think the unknown would have been probably the most difficult part of it, whereas nowadays, when we're off to go and climb a new peak somewhere, we kind of know a lot about the area, usually know a lot about the access. But I, I really think for those guys back then, that uh, 
the hardest bit would have just been not knowing how to get to the mountain because it was only the year before that the French had gone to Annapurna and they spent a couple of months trying to even find the mountain. And that was just because maps were inaccurate. They would talk to people who'd give them information that, that wasn't accurate. Uh, so the fact that they actually turned up at the mountain in relatively you know, short order without going too far astray was very good. I think one of the things that's most outstanding about this is it's really an extraordinary idea that Earl had in 1950, I suppose he started in 1950, to come, to come to India and try and climb a peak that he knew nothing about and to the, the organisation that was required. I really, I can't really imagine how he came up with such an outlandish idea. Um, but it worked. It's that big rock massive down low there's a snowy spur and there's a photo that that's me breathing hard and badly oxygen deprived and barely able to tilt the camera to the mountain but our children seem to have no problem getting up there we had our guide Anna Cook and her partner Dave to help us not to speak of several Nepalese guides a bunch of porters and a full kitchen crew Anna Cook's father had also been a mountaineer and in the same climbing circle as my father. It was somehow very satisfying that we had begun this adventure when my sister's daughter Una was barely three. Now here she was, nearly 18, and heading on up the moraine to Mukapabet. Maybe that's what this was all about. Whatever Hillary had thought about my father, he had started us on a great adventure across 20 years, which had taken us to a mountain near Tibet to show our children what was possible. I imagine he would have been quite pleased about that. Well, that's more good power for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, hey. A bear base camp was just a little further up around the corner here. It's a highlight of my life. side view of Mukapabat. Where else do we want to get to? Well, we'll make a camp up at Camp 1, and then tomorrow we'll just cruise right on up the glacier. Coming here has been so different, understanding what's involved. Even now with all the modern telecommunications, it's still been quite a marathon and a lot of effort on many people's part to get ourselves here. And we've had to acclimatise ourselves by trekking the Kauri Pass track. Then we've had to engage the porters, the Indian armies had to allow us to come in here. We got up, we got over a bone-shaking roads, which they had to walk. We've driven, but I'm not sure it's entirely better, just quicker. Um, <laughs> arrived in a moon landscape where our tents are frozen before the, the sun's even gone down. There's very little relief from the cold, even at this quite low altitude for our base camp. We're at um, 4,600 metres, although the grandchildren of Earl who are with us on this trip are all much better able to adapt to the altitude than us. Even they get very huffy and puffy and headachey at times. The going in, into this country is just unpleasant. It's hard to find any kind of route because everything is moraine-strewn glacial re remains and soft, unstable. But we didn't have to go up the mountain, just take a good look at it and work out how back in 1951 they had managed to climb it.
Finally, the day had come to try and climb the mountain they had come all this way for. My father, who had been very ill, remarkably seemed to regain his strength. He was determined that he was going to climb Mokopabet. Ed Hillary and George Lowe were on one rope and Ed Cotter and I on the other with passing in the middle of our rope. The main trouble was the southerly wind, almost gale force and bitingly cold. very poor snow conditions, very soft snow, and really struggling uh, at altitude. We, we got up to about uh, 22,000 feet after about four hours. Oh, and going back there, so this is, where's that place that you two, um, where you got the no, frozen we, feet? We were back, back, yes. It was quite a long way back, and they had a long, they had to the drop long, some height. That was height. probably that one they took. Yeah, and they dropped some height for some distance, and uh, we clicked with went back to, to look after Oh, it. that's the shop. There's the shop. Right there. uh, that's where we parted company. That's, we parted company there. We're pretty sure that that's that wedge of snow before you get onto the main ridge to the summit. And you can see that sheer rock face there, off that. George Lowe and Ed Hillary came over the top behind us, took one look at it, at the slope of green ice, said that it would take hours of cutting if it could be done, if it could be climbed at all, and that the climb couldn't be completed that day, and set off for home. They made the decision to return on several counts. Uh, one was that George's feet were is having difficulty with them. The other was that the summit was going to be unattainable that day, and um, Earl was still undeterred by that and decided to have a look over the small peak down into a little coal, I suppose you'd call it. Beyond that rose straight above us the ridge towards the summit. Oh, it was steep, the ice was green, very, very hard ice, uh, but Earl chopped down onto this little um, coal and then started cutting up the other side just to have a look. It was the photo that I had hung on my living room wall as a kind of defining existential moment in my father's life, when he and Ed Cotter went on and climbed the mountain and Hilary and Lowe turned back. It was somehow intriguing and ran counter to the prevailing narrative. Sorry, I, I can't tell Ed, Ed never criticised Earl Whitaford to me. Um, he, the only thing he said about Earl was he said he'd underestimated Earl's de determination. When, Ed, when Earl got to the top at Mokopaba, both Ed and George, when they turned back, never for a moment expected your dad and Ed Cotter to get to the top. And Ed says in the documentary, you know, we, we not for a moment, and we thought that they were the best climbers. And, Ed at this time called out, his last call to us was, uh, we'll never get up this way anyway, we'll have to go and have a look around the Tibetan side. And with that, Earl carried on. Pretty sure this dip here is it's actually up, up in there. there. Yeah. So there's a long way to go. Yeah. You can oh see, you can, it took them six hours mm. or something. You can see why Ed Hillary and George Lowe thought they weren't going to make yeah. it. Yeah. And they didn't get there till six o'clock at night oh, to the summit. Lucky they survived. Well, yeah, they were very lucky they survived. I suspect Hillary and Lowe figure they didn't have a chance, the, the other three, to, to go on and summit. And they figured, OK, well, we'll go back down and we'll all go up tomorrow. And I guess they were quite surprised that um, these uh, driven or foolhardy people carried on up to the summit and actually got there just before dark. Again, it was one of those uh, moments of mountaineering, and especially for New Zealand mountaineering at the time, where uh, that, that drive and fortitude paid off. 
Next section was a traverse over a series of bumps along crumbling rock crest, about the most sustained vertical wall of rock I've seen. So you can see this great sustained wall of rock there. Time was slipping away, about 2.30 now, as we started up a long ice ridge, about a thousand feet, which was climbed as before, right on the crest. The climb would have been impossible without crampons. Another two hours, and the climb was developing into a real marathon. Um, all day there had been a very strong wind from Tibet, and very cold, and it had been very discouraging. And of course we had stopped uh, at one stage, and to make a decision about carrying on, and that was when Passing had said, uh, yeah, a long way come, some two hours. So we <coughs> followed his uh, ruling and, and we carried on. And uh, it was a struggle even to within 20 or 30 feet of the final summit. We were not quite sure whether it was really worth the final effort. One step slowly after the other, never knowing literally up to the last 50 feet whether we would make it. And at last, 5.45, the top. Salute and a handshake from Pasang, and in a moment, Ed Cotter joined us. Wonderful view of the yellow plains of Tibet and a blue tinted glacier in Tibet below. Kamit just about crossed the way and a blessing, a little basin on the summit giving the only shelter of the whole climb. And it was astonishing to Ed and to George Lowe that he had, having been sick as he had been and, and weak, that he led that climb to the top of Mokapabad. And it, it sounds like he did it on pure, kind of been totally pure, he must have had a base fitness somewhere, but most of it sounds like sheer ferocious will and determination. Were you aware of that growing up? Did you, well, very much so. That was, you know, mm. made it a very difficult road. All the efforts of Bill Rutherford and my father, Ed Cotter, and Basang uh, getting up Mukat Parbat was what finally led to Hillary being able to climb Everest. And that was obviously getting the opportunity for the success of Earl and uh, my father and Pasang on, on Mukat Parbat, but also all of the skills that were learned along the way. Hillary coming from New Zealand straight to Everest probably would not have done it, but because they went to Mokat Parbat, they went through those challenges and possibly because Hillary didn't summit that time that he picked up some drive to know that he wouldn't let that happen again. And then to go along to the reconnaissance on Everest and spend more time at altitude, uh, that finally led to 1953, uh, him being in the position with the skills and experience that he had on the shoulders of the likes of, of Earl and my father to get there was what led to that success. And I think that, you know, I'm proud that my father was a part of that and that that led to one of the greatest moments in New Zealand mountaineering history. The first ascent of Mukapabat by my father, Ed Cotter and the Sherpa Passang was not only a great achievement, but was a moment that was to change the fortunes of New Zealand mountaineering in a spectacular manner and open the way to Everest. On their return to Ranakat, a hill station in northern India, they telegrammed their success to the New Zealand Alpine Club and prepared to go back to New Zealand. Excited by the news of the first ascent of Mukapabat, the New Zealand Alpine Club telegrammed Eric Shipton, leader of the British Reconnaissance Expedition, which as luck would have it, were heading for Everest at that very moment, offering the New Zealand climbers. Shipton had climbed previously with the New Zealander Dan Bryant. On the strength of this, he telegrammed the New Zealanders in Ranakat, inviting any two to join them. The 1951 British reconnaissance to Everest was not the year they climbed the mountain, but the expedition that was to work out if it could be climbed from the Nepalese side. Confusing, I know, but geopolitics had just changed everything. The British had previously tried to climb the mountain from the Tibetan side, which was no longer possible, as China had recently occupied Tibet after the communists had finally taken control of the country. 
This was just at the first period that Nepal was opening its borders. It was a kingdom, and they had never been invaded by the British. So it was actually quite magnanimous of them to enable this expedition in 51 to go and try and find a way up onto Everest. The expedition was led by Eric Shipton, who was a very well-known British mountaineer. He was famous for being able to organise an expedition on the back of an envelope. That night in the Westview Hotel in Ranakit was to be a defining moment. It was an opportunity that any mountaineer would dream of, but the telegram offered only two places and there were four of them, all of them ambitious for the possibilities the telegram presented. Any two could go were words that they had no real way of reconciling and a lifetime of bad feeling was to be the consequence. Recrimination. Um, why should you go? Why can't I go? That's your straws. I think you should go. This sort of stuff. It's a very difficult one to sort of deal with, but uh, it certainly um, split us apart, is Daniel. From had you got on comparatively well before that? I, you know, I think we'd got on, you know. Uh, well, as such, but uh, with the um, with what happened, it was it, it. You know, we had to take the train and head for Bombay and get on board a, a ship. Certainly, what I had heard was that uh, the statement was that Earl had said, "I'm going, and somebody else can come with me." That was what I heard, uh, um, but that was second hand. Uh, not sure I recall that. Yeah. No, well, the version that I heard, of course, was Earl's version. Uh, but I tackled George Lyle on the Bowen expedition in the tent with Norman when we were out there in the tent one time. And George just came out a real strong that, you know, Earl had no right to go. He was the fittest and he denied George Lyle the right to go. I don't think there was any real disagreement about the Ed Hillary mm. because he was unquestionably the fittest of them. Yeah. I think it was really between my father and George Lowe that was Yeah, and, and, and I, I think George, um, Ed thinks that, that George didn't deserve to go. Uh, the view I take on that is that Ed felt that George had already cost him one peak, Mukat Parbat, and Ed felt that uh, so was Lotton with Earl because Ed Earl was more reliable. He was more likely to get there. And George had not run out of money anyway. George was very bitter about, about Earl. I've spoken to uh, George Lowe was more critical of, of your dad than, than Ed ever was. How they dealt with the fallout is quite telling. George Lowe came out with both guns blazing in his book, Because It Is There. My father replied with a letter to the Alpine Club. Hillary's telling got progressively negative, and Ed Cotter pretty much kept his own counsel and left the room. I can't help but sympathise with my father's case, as he had organised the trip, got them there, and then along with Ed Cotter and Passan, climbed Mukapabat, which had garnered them the invitation. Eric, really, later on, when talking to him about it, he said he, he uh, you know, was very concerned about, because he said when he had, had sent this telegram, any two of you can join us, uh, he didn't give it any, hadn't given it any proper thought at all. Mm -hmm. And it was just like sending a, a big parcel through them. What's the name that blew you apart? Mm. So it, Earl and uh, Ed uh, had the resources to be able to get there, mm. and the two of us were mm. absolutely flat. So in the end, George Lowe and Yukata took the ship back to New Zealand and Hillary and my father journeyed through Nepal to join the British Everest Reconnaissance Expedition in 1951. Although Ed Cotter never did get to try his luck on the world's highest mountain, his son Guy Cotter was to become one of the world's leading mountaineering guides on Everest. So I first went to Everest in 1992. I uh, went there to work as a, a mountain guide along with Rob Hall and Gary Ball 
on the first commercial expedition that they ran as adventure consultants to Everest. So I've been there uh, seven times to climb it, five times I've summited, a couple of times I've been involved in helping people down who got into trouble while the rest of our team went to summit. I took over the reins of adventure consultants after Rob Hall passed away in 1996 on Everest. I went back in 97 and have uh, the company Adventure Consultants ever since and we've been guiding mountains all over the world. Mountaineering's been a passion of mine that I picked up from, from my father and my first exposure to the outdoors. Time has an interesting way of working things out. Ed Cotter and my father's climb of Mokopabe had had seen Guy Cotter up Everest and brought me back here all these years later to make a documentary I had been sure I didn't want to make. It was time for us to leave Mokopabat. It had been an extraordinary trip. We all felt so lucky to have come and finally understood what an important achievement it had been. This expedition was peculiarly significant for New Zealanders getting involved with Everest. If they hadn't climbed Mokopabat, they wouldn't have been invited to go on the reconnaissance. If they hadn't gone on the reconnaissance, they wouldn't have had the contacts with the British climbers who subsequently were involved on the Hunt 53 expedition that successfully climbed Everest. And I'm not even sure that we would have had that involvement in Nepal that has formed such a special relationship over the subsequent 60 years. Two of them got and joined um, uh, with uh, Shipton. Um, they proved to be technically ex exactly what we now can see, extremely competent. And it was th those two, the New Zealanders, who really worked out that you could get up and got up the Kumbu Icefall. Um, uh, because that sort of ice work was totally beyond the experience of anybody else on that trip, except possibly um, uh, Sh Shipton. And I think that established the, as it were, the right of New Zealanders <laughs> to, to be being Brits, in every sense of the word, uh, on, uh, on an expedition to... Uh, Everest. Now the Kumbu Icefall had been seen from the north side by Mallory and Dan Bryant I believe and they could see this horrible cascading river of ice being the Kumbu Icefall which was the the route up into the Western Kum and the Western Kum is a is a lovely little valley that the uh, glacier that runs down between Nupsi, Lhotse and Everest and the way up to South Cole. Once you're in the Western Kum, the way to the summit is, is quite clear, but the Kumbu Icefall itself uh, looked and has proved many times since to be a very treacherous uh, and dangerous approach to the mountain. But from the Nepalese side, it's really the only way to go. I saw for the first time that it looked to be possible to Kumbu Icefall and get up to the South Cole and climb Everest that way. The first trip we did up the, the ice floor was passing, and, and I, Ed was ill, he had some kind of boat. Passing and I went in one party, and Tom Ward Dillon and Mark Ward in another. Then we went by different routes, they went up this side, and we chose a route up this side, and we got a fair way up the ice floor. And needless to say, the others didn't get very far at all. They, they were terrific climbers, they were, they were great, great mountaineers, but they just were not used to that sort of thing at all. They didn't really have a have a clue as to how to get through an ice fall. But uh, we, we went a fair way and came back, and then, then the whole party went up and got some distance up the ice fall. 
And then somewhat to our rage and fury, Schiff has said we ought to go away and, and do a um, reconnaissance elsewhere and look around. Of course, I mean, I, I was rather naive. I, did, I never thought at the time, but I suppose that he had four Englishmen who were completely unacclimatized and couldn't really do anything. And two New Zealanders bounding around fully acclimatized, and it uh, wasn't a situation which she wanted to, to <laughs> exploit at <laughs> all. So we dispersed. I mean, uh, of course, our view was we, we could have given the South Collar Prize sort of thing, but I don't know how far we would have got, but we certainly would have liked it. Not long after we returned, Lynn McKinnon's book about my father in Ekota was published. It seemed like a very satisfying final chapter in a long journey of discovery. What a magnificent job you've done. I mean, I, I could say, I could go on and on, but you just don't know what this means to, to us as a family. Um, I know how absolutely delighted our mother would be if she knew. I'm really happy. And um, we can be lucky. lucky. And we're so lucky. It's not the correct story. Ed Hillary's got his story. George Lowe has his story. There isn't a final you know, the actual facts. There is a truth, truth though, isn't there? There's it? a truth, of course there's a truth, but they're, they're all combined. If you could put them, if you could know them all together simultaneously, that is the truth. Well, the truth is there is an objective truth. Well, there's an objective truth that Earl organised it. And if you looked last night at this, at this material Leonard put out, which was like the evidence, and it was great she did that, you could see that people in the New Zealand government, in the Alpine Club, um, were writing to Earl as the leader of that expedition. Your expedition, he was the person who was organising it. So there's the truth that he was the person who was the leader of that expedition in the sense of organising it. I'm not talking about as they climbed up a ridge, I'm talking about who put it together. So that's the truth. Um, and that is not acknowledged well. Um, what happened in Ranakit is what I'm talking about. It's very hard to know the truth about. Um, because I think each person was so tied up in their desire to join that expedition. It was very hard for any of them to see it from each other's point of view. Um, so, what else is the truth? The, another truth is that um, Earl and Ed Cotter and Pasang Dawa Lama climb Mukapawit. That's the truth, and it's, the tr it's also the truth that they their climb is the reason they got the New Zealand Alpine Club felt inspired to contact um, the British expedition and ask if they could be included. So these that's are the truth. There's a letter <coughs> the tell there's a letter there from Harry Stevenson to Earl Woodford saying, "We are so pleased that did you see that letter mm -hmm. that you climbed the mountain? We're going to contact the British to see if you can be included." So that is the truth. Um, and it's also the truth that Earl and Ed Hillary, by being on the Everest reconnaissance, established a place for New Zealanders in the 1953 climb of Everest, that if they hadn't gone on that 1951 reconnaissance, it's highly unlikely that they would have been involved in the 1953 expedition. As it was, there's a letter you can see there from Sir John Hunt Earl, they, he was very unhappy about having to include New Zealanders. He did not want to do that. He wanted it to be a British expedition. He wanted them to all know each other. You know, he wanted to build a core d'esprit. He did not want these outsiders coming along. And apparently, and I think it must be in the book, it was the it was the lobbying of the um, of the English climbers to hunt the ones who'd been on the 1951 expedition, saying you must get these. New Zealanders involved. So? So there are quite a, no Richard you're right, there's quite a lot of truth and factual material here. Having begun the story more in Hillary's camp than in my father's and ending it feeling much less conflicted about my father and with a lot more respect for the extraordinary things he achieved, it occurs to me that maybe Hillary was laying down the gauntlet to me and my family and daring us to find out for ourselves what happened. 
So thank you, Ed, for pushing us out the door and up the mountain to look a bit further. <laughs>